Okay, so welcome to everyone to the latest Insignia webinar, this time on the topic of crisis management, the ultimate test of leadership. I'm Jonathan Hemus, I'm the Managing Director of Insignia. For those of you who don't know us well, Insignia is a crisis management consultancy which helps organizations to do and say the right thing on the worst day of their professional lives. Now, when that moment happens, of course, it is what you do and say on that worst day of your professional lives that's really going to count. No organization can prevent a crisis, but what you do and say on that day will undoubtedly have a significant effect on the organization's future. And as usual, Richard Branson had something to say on this matter. He said, the test of a company's leadership and of a CEO in particular usually comes during a crisis. So over the next hour, and we will finish within the hour, we want to look at what we believe are 10 key principles that help to define an effective and a successful crisis management leader. Please do ask us uh, any questions via the uh, chat or question box on your screen. Uh, we'll deal with those at the end, but please feel free to send them through uh, as you think of them, and we'll cover as many of them as we can at the end. I should also uh, confirm that all of the materials from this presentation will also be sent to you subsequent to the presentation. So, I guess, Certainly in, in Europe, um, the model for effective crisis management leadership was probably first established in 1989. This is the Kegworth air crash just off the M1 in the, in the Midlands of, of England. And the guy you see um, uh, tending to the patient on the right hand side, for those of you who don't know, that is Michael Bishop, who was at that time the chief executive of the airline British Midland, who uh, suffered this fatal air crash. Michael Bishop intuitively did and said all of the right things. He diverted his car from where he was traveling to and went straight to the scene. He began doing media interviews saying all of the right things as he approached the crashed aircraft. And he was very much there for the families and the people who were affected. And his leadership also provided people within the business and outside the business that despite this awful thing happening and despite caring for the people really effectively, in the long term, this was a business which would prevail. And crisis leadership is very much about doing and saying things to address the immediate aftermath of the incident, but also inspiring confidence that there is a future beyond this awful event. So Michael Bishop really was the very first epitome of the effective crisis leader. And those of you who've been on uh, these webinars in the past will know that this is one of our favorite uh, slides because it is so powerful. This is the research conducted by Oxford Metrica, which shows what happens to organizations in the year after a crisis. And what they found was that the actions and the words that take place in the days and sometimes much shorter than that, immediately after the crisis event, will determine whether the organization a year later ends up as being a winner, an organization that actually overperforms expectations, or a loser, one that ends up a year later much worse off than the moment before the crisis. What you do and say in those hours and days immediately after the crisis will have a significant medium and long-term impact on the destiny of that organization in future. So let's now move on and take a look at those 10 key principles for effective and successful crisis management leadership. Number one, create a crisis resistant culture. It's much better to prevent the crisis than have to deal with it in the first place. So 
one of the key tasks of a leader in crisis management is to create the kind of culture which prevents a crisis from happening in the first place. This uh, slide shows the Toshiba chief executive resigning a couple of months ago, having misreported uh, profits uh, between the years 2008 and 2014. And the investigation that went into that event and the report that followed said, within Toshiba, there was a corporate culture in which one could not go against the wishes of superiors. Therefore, when top management presented challenges, division presidents, line managers and employees below them continually carried out inappropriate accounting practices to meet targets in line with the wishes of their superiors. This is a culture which creates a high potential for crisis and much worse creates the potential for one of those internally generated crises which are often the most damaging of all and uh, we can probably all think of a certain car manufacturer that is encountering very similar problems right now through an internally generated crisis that maybe was partly because of the culture within that organization. So how do we avoid that? What kind of culture is crisis resistant? Well, it's one in which leadership is prepared to hear that we have a problem. It's an organization in which people at the very front line are encouraged to put their hand up and say, I think we might have a problem here. It's an organization which is not overly bureaucratic or hierarchical. And it's, it's an organization which doesn't impose the kind of just do it targets that result in people taking shortcuts or coming up with creative ways of achieving targets. If people are put under such pressure and such focus to achieve a certain outcome, whether it be financial performance, whether it be environmental performance, whatever, if that results in shortcuts being taken, inappropriate shortcuts, that's when the potential for crisis really begins within an organization. So think very much about the crisis that you, the crisis, the culture that you are creating. The second key principle for an effective crisis leader is to beware of denial. You can only manage a crisis if you recognize that you are facing one. Sepp Blatter in 2011 said, crisis, what is a crisis? Football is not in a crisis. I suspect he might still be saying the same thing today, but others might have a different view. So denial is the enemy of crisis management. And uh, the analogy that particularly comes to mind for me is the uh, apocryphal story of the frog in the saucepan, uh, where apparently if you put a frog into a saucepan in cold water and gently, gently, gently turn up the heat, the frog will simply stay in the saucepan and be boiled alive. That is the equivalent of one of those creeping crises that just get worse and worse and worse. And because we're not looking and sensing, we don't notice that we're in in the middle of a crisis. So leaders need to be vigilant. Leaders need to be open to the idea that we might have a problem around here. Leaders need to be wary of believing their own PR and they need to have trusted third parties who are prepared to challenge them, to give them an alternative perspective, to say, boss, I think we do have a problem here. It's about being open minded and it's about spending time on the shop floor. Denial is the enemy of crisis management. The third key principle, and this is one of the most important of all, be true to your values, even in crisis. In fact, I would say be true to your values, especially in crisis. The images you see here are of Jenny Britton Bauer, the owner of an ice cream company based in, in the States, 
very organic, very healthy, very sustainable ice cream company who unfortunately last year had a load of listeria in their products, which meant that they had to close down a number of their shops for a number of weeks and withdraw much product. Her quote was, values exist in the great times, but they also exist in the shitty times. If you abandon those during the worst times, then they're not yours really. So we all trumpet our values. We all put them on our websites. We tell customers about them. We tell investors about them. But when you have a crisis, that is when your values are put to the test. I read yesterday that 35 of the FTSE 100 uh, businesses have integrity as one of their core values. If that's the case, those 35 organizations, when they encounter a crisis, had better show integrity in the way that they respond to that crisis. Our experience is that organizations that respond to a crisis in a way that cuts across their values, those are the ones that suffer most. So your values had better be more than skin deep, and it's really important to live them out under the intense pressure of a, of a crisis. And I would note as well, I think, again, one of the reasons why the VW crisis is striking them so hard is that they are known to be a trusted, reputable organization with quality and reliability at their core. Those values and those qualities have been challenged potentially overturned by the events of the crisis and that's why one of the key reasons why it is potentially so damaging to that organization the fourth key principle set the communication agenda this is not a new lesson but it is even more important in the social media age leaders understand that they need to set the agenda rather than follow it. And that means communicating quickly, proactively, and transparently. This is Tony Fernandez talking in the aftermath of the crash of AirAsia flight QZ8501. He was tweeting immediately, news broke, that that plane was missing. He communicated openly via social media and conventional media. And most personally, he provided his personal mobile phone number to all of the families of the victims. And his mantra for communication during that incident was, we never hide. So leaders need to set the communication agenda if they want to remain in control of their organization's destiny. The other danger, of course, of not communicating is the risk that you appear uncaring, incompetent, or simply don't know what you're doing. So effective crisis leaders set the communication agenda. Take responsibility for decision making. A crisis requires leaders to make decisions. And one of the most common flaws that we see is a failure to take decisions, either at all or quickly enough. And there are a number of reasons for this. You're always waiting for that next piece of information that will make everything clear and that will make your decision easy. You're always worried about making the wrong decision. What if this turns out not to be the best decision? Effective leaders weigh up the situation, get as many facts as they can, and they then make decisions. It is only by making decisions that you can influence the way in which the crisis plays out and you can retain influence over your organization's reputation and long-term health. So leaders recognize that sometimes in a crisis, it's not about making a perfect decision. It's about making the least bad decision. Sometimes there are no 
golden tickets. There are no winning answers, but there are least bad decisions. And leaders recognize that all they can do in a crisis is to make the best decision they can with the information they have at that time. Beware decision making paralysis. Beware waiting for that key piece of information that you believe will unlock uh, the answer to a particular decision. Good but also swift decision making is important in a crisis and I believe that's something that Nick Varney of Merlin after the Alton Town Smiler crash uh, embodied very successfully. He said uh, on the day of that crash Irrespective of the outcome of current investigations into the causes of the accident, we have accepted full responsibility to those who have been injured in the accident and confirmed that we will ensure that compensation will be provided to them. He's not waiting, he's not prevaricating, he is making a clear decision and taking clear responsibility. Leaders understand that decision making goes with the territory. Never hide behind your advisors. Advisors are crucially important in a crisis and I would recommend any leadership team builds a strong group of advisors uh, in whom they trust ahead of the crisis. In addition to building trust, respect and relationships between the leaders and the advisors, I would also strongly recommend building relationships between the advisors and I think we will all have uh, observed or experienced the um, stereotypical uh, tightrope um, tug of war sorry between communicators and lawyers with in the extreme communicators saying tell them everything tell them everything and tell it now and lawyers stereotypically saying tell them nothing no comment is the answer one of the ways of avoiding that impasse or that conflict is building those relationships ahead of time and potentially walking through some scenarios with the lawyers and the communicators and the other advisors present to actually test out how would we respond to these high risk situations for our organization. Ultimately though, leaders understand that they must not hide behind their advisors. Get great advisors, ask the lawyers for their best advice on how to minimize legal risks, ask the communicators for their best advice on how to minimize reputational risk, ask the accountants for their best advice on how to minimize financial risk. Listen to that advice, but then once more, it's the leader who must make the decision. This is John McCain from Maple Leaf who had a, another Listeria incident in Canada in 2008 affecting their cooked meats. He put it in very stark terms. Going through the crisis, there are two advisors I paid no attention to. The first are the lawyers and the second are the accountants. It's not about money or legal liability. This is about our being accountable for providing customers with safe food. So take advice, but leaders need to do what they believe is right in the best interests of the organization and in the best interests of its stakeholders. And I'm sure we can all think of examples where it probably appears from the outside at least that the advisors have maybe guided the organization strategy rather than the organization itself. It's your organization, your reputation, take the advice, but you decide. I just remind you again at this point, we're about uh, halfway through the uh, webinar. If you have any questions, please do post them via the chat box and uh, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Okay, so moving on to the next principle, be visible. A 
crisis will of necessity have uh, what is effectively a crisis bunker where the senior team, sometimes called the goal team, will be sitting, analysing what's going on, receiving the facts and setting the course for managing uh, the crisis. The CEO or, and the senior leaders will be in that crisis room, but what's important is that they don't seal themselves off in that, uh, in that bunker. Because in a crisis, leaders need to be visible. Again, as Richard Branson said, when the chips are down and your company is about to make headlines for the wrong reasons, there is nothing more important for a CEO than being present. And as an aside, uh, Richard Branson published a blog just last month in September on his, I think it was four um, key principles uh, for crisis management, and it's 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 well worth a read. So uh, I'd recommend you take a look at his views on crisis management. He certainly followed his own advice in the two major crises that um, he has uh, faced in his time as leader of that organisation. So the Cumbria rail crash, when a train derailed over the uh, Christmas period and a uh, passenger was, was killed. Richard Branson, of course, cut short his holiday in Switzerland, was at the scene of the accident, talking to the media, talking to passengers, talking to his staff, and really answering those two questions which are always so important in a crisis and which are always being asked of organisations. Are they competent and do they care? Are they competent to manage this situation and do they really care about what's happened? And by being visible, by being present, uh, a leader is much more able to answer those questions uh, successfully. The third thing that a leader can do, and I mentioned this earlier on, but I do think it's worth emphasizing, is as well as communicating compassion and care and concern and the immediate actions that they are taking, and those are all vital messages, the other key role for the leader is to inspire confidence in the future not least with your employees, your, your staff. They often get forgotten in a crisis situation, but they are so crucial. Um, they will be feeling battered and bruised. They will be feeling uncertain. They'll be feeling concerned. And so the more that can be done to communicate with them and inspire their confidence and, and faith in the future, the better. Just imagine how VW's employees are feeling right now. So the job of the leader is to answer those two questions. Are you competent? Do you care? And to inspire confidence in the future. And you can only do that by being visible. As well as being visible, it's important to be personal. So a lot of leaders spend a lot of time in meetings with investors or analysts or government ministers or other business people, peers in other organizations. But that kind of potential ivory tower and the management speak and jargon and formality that comes with that is very unhelpful in a crisis situation. In a crisis situation, the outside world is looking to hear from personal, human, authentic leaders who communicate and act like normal, feeling human beings. So it's time to throw away the corporate jargon. It's time to put away the metaphorical pinstripe suit and talk like a straightforward, compassionate, concerned individual. This example here is uh, from Paul Pester, the chief executive of TSB Bank. Um, TSB uh, last year had a service outage whereby 
customers were unable to uh, remove money from uh, TSB's ATMs and they were out of action for just under 24 hours. Paul Pester took to Twitter to communicate directly with customers in a very down-to-earth, straightforward, human way. Very simple language, no, no jargon, no management speech, just straightforward words, including tweets like this. My apologies to TSB customers having problems with their cards. I'm working hard with my team now to try to fix the problems, PDP. So straightforward language, um, simple language, and the touch that I really like is the PDP bit. Those are his initials, which I think would clearly signify to the uh, outside world, this is actually Paul Pester communicating not his PR team. And he got really good feedback for that, that personal approach, both from customers, and you can probably just see on the, uh, on the slide there, even from the media. Joe Lynham is one of the BBC's business correspondents. He said in a tweet in response, impressed to see TSB boss Paul Pester responding personally to customers angry at IT glitch. So um, even the... Uh, even the media were recognizing this was a CEO who was communicating in a very personal, very human way. Our ninth principle is it's not about you. Now, CEOs and leaders of organizations are clearly very important people um, who may also have something of an ego. And it's important that uh, an effective crisis leader has the self-awareness and the humility to recognize that when a crisis happens, it's not about them. Frankly, nobody cares about the impact on them or their business or the finances, what they really care about is the impact on the people affected by the crisis. That clearly is especially true where there have been injuries or even worse fatalities. It also applies when there's been an environmental incident or a physical incident whereby maybe people's homes have been affected. It also means that people are more interested in whether individuals within the business will be losing their job rather than the CEO, him or herself. What I would say as an aside, though, is um, I think the media in particular like to create a, a clear and easy narrative. And so they will be looking to put the chief executive into the role of hero or villain and uh, I think the tendency will be to put them in the villain perspective rather than the hero perspective. And the chief executive needs to be aware of that, do everything in, the, in their power to avoid being put into the role of villain. So it's not about you. It's about having the emotional intelligence to understand that it's about those affected. And um, the most famous quote from the BP oil spill that we will all have heard, but which did epitomize probably wrongly the perception of Tony Haywood was, I want my life back. We all understand, and I'm sure he did too, that it really wasn't about him. It was about the men who had died in the initial accident and the many hundreds and thousands of others whose livelihoods and, and homes were uh, impacted by the by the oil spill. So it's not about you, it's about the people affected. The final principle, do the right thing and say the right thing. It's about doing both. It's about having the courage to do the right thing and the courage to say the right thing. 
doing the right thing can mean taking some very difficult, costly, and or unpleasant actions. It can mean grounding a fleet of aircraft. It can mean recalling a hugely successful product because of safety fears which in your gut you believe actually don't exist. It can mean firing a high performing and much loved colleague. Doing the right thing sounds easy but in practice often isn't. But leaders need to do the right thing. They also need to say the right thing. Again, leaders sometimes find it hard to say the right thing because it's uncomfortable and it's unusual for them to have to communicate in such an open, stripped bare kind of a way. We're not we're no longer talking about EBITDA and strategic realignment and our vision for the future. We're saying things like, I'm sorry. I take personal responsibility for this. We will do everything in our power to put this situation right. So leaders need to have the courage to do the right thing and say the right thing. I take you back to the Alton Towers uh, Smiler uh, accident. I believe that Nick Varney, the CEO of Merlin, did both things. In terms of the words, again, on day one, I would like to express my sincerest regret and apology to everyone who suffered injury and distress today and to their families. Apology is a word and so is sorry that sometimes we really fight shy of in a crisis. He knew what the right thing to say was and he was quick to say it. Did they act on those words? Well, the evidence is that they did. Victoria Balch, one of the unfortunate victims of the crash, was quoted in September in the BBC as saying, I do think they're doing everything they can for the families. Equally, the lawyer for the victims has been quoted as saying Merlin and Alton Towers is doing everything they can to look after the victims and the families. And that is not uh, always a, a, a common situation to have both the victims and the lawyers for the victims actually commending the organization on what they have done and what they have said. So crisis management is the acid test for an organization and for its leaders and handled well with the right behaviors and with the right words and the right actions a well-managed crisis can result in enhanced trust, respect and reputation for the organization and for the leaders of, the, of that organization. And by applying the 10 principles that we've talked through uh, here, I think we have a framework for uh, success. So I'd now like to move on to uh, questions. We'll spend uh, 10 minutes or so on questions. We've already got uh, four or five, but please feel free to uh, post, uh, post some more. So I am going to uh, just take them as they come. Um, okay, first question, how do you measure the success of how a crisis has been managed? I think there are uh, a number of ways of doing that, but I would say you can probably only measure the, the success of how well a crisis has been managed in the medium to long term. It's very uh, hard to identify in the immediate aftermath of a crisis how well the organization is doing. I go back to that Oxford Metrica chart. It shows that in the first four to five days after a crisis, the value of an organization, if you are a publicly quoted organization always goes down because it's a time of uncertainty and the outside world is re-evaluating the organization and determining was all of the 
great words that we heard from the leaders before the crisis, were they uh, genuine or was it just PR puff? And so it's very hard to evaluate in the in the short term. I think the uh, long term test is whether customers come back to you, whether sales continue, whether if you're a charity, donations continue, whether the value of the organization goes up or down in the longer term. And this, again, is one of the um, key challenges uh, for a leader. Decisions need to be made which are in the best long term interests of the organization, which may cost money in the short term, may potentially do harm in the short term, but which you know in your heart are the right things to do, both for those affected, but also the right things to do for the long-term health of the organization. Okay, uh, next question. How do you balance the need to be in the business during a crisis and the desire to be visible to external stakeholders? Uh, it's a good question and it is a fine balance. Um, I think particularly when we talk about the top person in the organization, using them in the most effective way is uh, a critical requirement of effective crisis management. The worst case, and what you certainly want to avoid, is for the most senior person in the organization to be tactically dealing with the crisis, getting involved in the drafting of the press release or the real minutiae of what's what's going on. I think they probably need to have a foot in both camps. They do need to be within the organization, um, certainly in contact with the crisis management team. They don't necessarily need to be leading it, but they do need to be setting the overall strategy for the crisis response. I think there's a critical internal role that I've mentioned a couple of times about inspiring and uh, maintaining the confidence of people within the business. And I think there is, uh, on occasions, a requirement for that person to be seen by external stakeholders. But I think it's about using your leader judiciously. If we come back to uh, Tony Haywood as, as an example, Clearly, he was much criticized for his leadership of the uh, Gulf oil spill. I think he had to be in the in the front line, but I think he could have been in the front line out in the States for one day or three days, not as the face of BP for that entire crisis. So it's about understanding the skills uh, of your leader, where they can be used to best effect uh, and responding accordingly. Okay, um, question here. Um, as an advisor, how do you best tackle the elephant in the room getting past a CEO slash leader's ego? The I know best because I'm CEO argument. What steps can we take before a crisis to best create a more conducive environment for managing a crisis? So clearly every uh, situation is different. Every CEO is different, but I would suggest one of the most important things is building a strong and trusting relationship between a CEO and their advisors based on mutual respect. You know, uh, many CEOs, as, as I mentioned, uh, have an ego. Uh, they wouldn't be a number of them CEOs if they didn't have, have an ego, but it is important that there is that trusting relationship and that respect between them and their advisors. And the advisors have the uh, integrity and the courage to give the CEO uh, advice and guidance that they may not want to hear. Um, ultimately, we've said advisors advise and leaders decide. I would say, you know, say on the advisor's side, it is our responsibility to give best advice and to give that in a constructive, uh, respectful manner to persuade our, uh, leaders and CEOs as, as best as we can. But ultimately, it is the CEO who will decide. The 
accountability for the organization and the management of this crisis will rest on their shoulders and so ultimately they do have to be the ones who make that final decision. One uh, further point I'd make on that, this is though another reason why running exercises ahead of a crisis is so important because these um, dynamics within a team, these relationships, these interplays, um, they will become apparent during your exercising and either them having become apparent within the exercising, we can work out how we actually do things better or differently in future based on our learnings from that exercise or as a minimum we can understand better what we will be dealing with when the real crisis happens so uh, I would suggest that exercising is another uh, another way of helping to address that particular uh, issue uh, okay um, next question what is your take on the excuse video that showed Mr. Vinterkorn just two days after the blow? To me, it appeared as if they jumped the gun too fast and the whole video was just textbook crisis comms response. Not authentic, not truthful, a bit like I want my life back without saying it. My question, if you're not blessed with a charismatic leader like Fernandez or Branson, what is your advice? Keep him out of the public question mark. So the first thing I'd like to uh, respond to on that uh, very insightful question is there is now a very real danger and I really hope we're not adding to it with these uh, 10 principles. There is a very real danger of uh, managing a crisis like painting by numbers. Um, these principles that you see on the screen now, I believe wholeheartedly that they are right, but they need to be embedded within the leader and embedded within the organization, not just pulled out of a drawer and say, oh yes, we must do this, 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 and this. So the excuse uh, video, or more generally, the CEO uh, or leader that comes onto television and says, my sincere condolences to all of those who have been affected by this crisis. It doesn't work. So empathy, humanity, authenticity is so important. Um, if you ever get a chance uh, to see uh, Mr. McCain, the um, Maple Food CEO, doing some of his crisis interviews, there was real emotion coming through this is this is a guy who really believed what he was saying and if you have uh, a CEO uh, like that it is a wonderful asset in a crisis situation if you don't then I do think it is about using the person judiciously they may need to face up to the media or to other stakeholders in a crisis. If they are the top person in the organization, there are situations in which they simply cannot be hidden away from those affected. But as per the Tony Hayward situation, use them judiciously and put forward your more empathetic uh, communicators uh, as soon as possible afterwards. Again, without wanting to suggest that we uh, manipulate our spokespeople or our leaders. I do think it's an area where training is also important. Firstly, because we will uh, identify and understand actually how our leaders do communicate and come across um, during a crisis. And secondly, hopefully we can help them to throw off that uh, metaphorical uh, pinstripe suit and begin to communicate in the more personal uh, human way that is much more uh, appropriate in a crisis situation. So I think we have got through all of the questions at that point. If you do have any last questions, please do uh, post them now. And we do. Um, how should companies respond to the receipt of threats from an external source? Um, I think I would need to uh, 
uh, ask for clarification on that question to make sure I'm answering it uh, specifically right, but I will talk in general terms uh, to that question. So the question is, how should companies respond to the receipt of threats from an external source? So I think first thing to say is um, it's important for an organization to have done its uh, risk assessment and to identify what the potential threats are and to go beyond the conventional uh, risk assessment which purely looks at operational matters, IT failure, um, fire, flood, building unavailability, to look also at the reputational risks and uh, again as I've alluded to earlier the human and kind of organizational crises, those that are internally generated, are often the most uh, under-analyzed but the most damaging when they actually uh, happen. I'm going to take a uh, a, a guess at where um, the thrust of that question may be coming from. Um, sometimes when you get a threat from an external source, uh, you will have to decide whether to uh, make that public or not. And the example that I'm thinking of here very specifically is uh, cybercrime. So we may know that we have been attacked and maybe uh, confidential customer or maybe employee information has been compromised, that presents us uh, with a very difficult challenge. Do we uh, try and keep it quiet and deal with the um, situation and put it right without talking about it in the public domain or do we, do we go public? It's a difficult balancing act but uh, as a, as a community, as, as a communicator, um, we need to recognize that if we don't say anything and uh, people's data has been compromised, they are going to be very angry, disappointed, upset uh, that maybe their credit card details have been compromised and they weren't, uh, they weren't properly um, communicated with. Okay. Right, so uh, in summary, 10 principles for uh, effective crisis leadership. Subsequent to this event, we will share with you uh, the full report which uh, came out of this uh, webinar with more detail and more insights into uh, effective crisis leadership. We will also uh, share with you a link to a video on the same subject and a recording of uh, this entire webinar will also be uh, available to you. Uh, final thing uh, to say uh, from my point of view is we do now have uh, a new website where you can get lots of other uh, resources in the way of videos, white papers, and presentations. So if you're interested in crisis management matters, please do visit our new website and uh, you'll be able to download materials from there. We'll be running our next webinar uh, early in December, so uh, keep a lookout for the next invitation. And finally, for those of you who are uh, not yet working with Insignia, we do as part of these webinars always offer uh, a maximum of three uh, crisis audits for organizations who would like us to have a quick look under the bonnet of their uh, crisis management infrastructure and give you uh, top line feedback on our view of how that compares with best practice. So um, first three people to request one of those audits will uh, will be entitled to one. So thank you all very much for joining the session. Uh, I hope you found it useful. We will be sending you out further information uh, afterwards, and I wish you a crisis-free afternoon. Thank you.